Here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. The great American trucker convoy coming right on through. Yep, giant, giant affair. Blinked, almost missed it. Uh, All of one truck. One guy. One guy. And I'm going to spend a little time on that. Uh, But a lot to get to. What's going on in Ukraine? Uh, What's going on in the state of working America? Uh, Insanity here at home. So much to get to in today's program. I'm going to start with the, I have friends who believe Trump's going to go to jail for something. Uh, bad news today for you, because look, I've said from the beginning, I doubt I doubt we hold any president ever accountable for anything that happens. Uh, the only thing I thought possibly he could be held accountable for is what was going on in New York with the, the, the big business and the, uh, the, undervaluing, overvaluing the gamesmanship to seek loans and pay less taxes and do all that stuff. Uh, Turns out today, two prosecutors resigned in New York, uh, which is kind of, I guess, throwing this whole thing into who knows whereville. And I guess we'll hear more as the days and weeks come on. Uh, April, I guess, was the end of the, the grand jury. So will they convene another one? I I doubt it. So there you go. Very happy day for Donald. On the other side, we find out that Ivanka, Ivanka is is dealing with the January 6th commission. Uh, The committee folks there are, and who knows, who knows what she's going to say. Now, she is being viewed as the key because she was involved in everything. She was right there for everything wouldn't it be interesting wouldn't it be interesting if because i've always said she's the most ruthless she's by far uh the one with the the biggest stones she's the one with the the steely spine she's the one who would gut you and look you in the eye while while smiling uh the other two idiots uh, that, that they call her brothers uh they're done uh, I think she throws the whole the whole clan under the bus. Will it matter? I doubt it. But I think to save her skin, I think that that could happen. And here's the thing: I think that Donald would actually would actually then uh, even want to date her more. So so there is that. Uh, so there you go. There's your your Trump news for the day. Uh, but I got to get to this 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 trucker uh, convoy guy because the big news today was you know the the big trucker convoy you know it's going to head on down the road and you know all these truck drivers are going to you know they're going to shut things down cuz we'll show them we'll show Canada how it's really done so this this guy uh his name is Bob Bolus uh Bob Bolus uh, was was the birth lottery winner of a trucking company his family you know started a trucking company back you know back during the depression uh he is third generation Got it the old-fashioned way. It was handed to him. But one of these guys, again, born on third base, thinks he hit a triple. And he has been a pain in the, in the side for you know years in the Scranton area, from what I'm told. Uh, anti-union guy. Uh, my personal experience with bolus drivers over the years has been they view the company very negatively. Uh, shoddy equipment poor treatment you know the kind of pushing regulations pushing things and and it, it showed in mr bolus driving down the road today and i want to get to that in a minute but here's this guy who again this is supposed to be about the truckers this is supposed to be about angry truckers mad at, at vaccine mandates this is supposed to be about those guys who are making their living on the road those people who are living in their trucks like 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 like, like well caged animals a sweatshop on wheels. It's supposed to be about them and their grievances, not the owner class, not the not the wealthy, not the folks who are who are making conditions horrible. No, no, it's supposed to be about the truckers. Remember. So Bob Bolus, the trucker, and I got I got to ask, and I asked state police, 
Uh, is there a way you can find out that this guy's actually got a CDL? We'll find out. But there was Bob in the one truck trucker convoy. <laughs> There he was, man. The trailer adorned with anti-Trump or anti-Biden, you know, you know the, the, the go, let's go Brandon stuff, the love Trump, uh, freedom, all, all kind of jingoism, all there for on display. A rolling billboard to insanity. Doing 50 miles an hour in a 65 with a long line of cars behind him. Now, understand, these people weren't in line with him. These were people who, during a rush hour commute trying to go home. And Bob, keep this up, making friends on the road. Because I swear I saw an old lady drive by and give him, share the number one with him. Keep that up. Get into D.C. and block traffic up. You're going to make lots of friends. And, and this, is, this is part of this, this privilege that someone like this has. He, he, he got major news coverage. There were major news outlets covering this one man convoy. And I got to tell you, I, uh, I've been parts of convoys, you know, multiple trucks talking to each other on the CB, you know, doing a little ratchet, John, you know, hang, you know passing the time through the night to get to where you got to go. I get that. One man is not a convoy. And maybe, I mean, who knows? Maybe, maybe. He, I, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know how you could call this, but he had two pickup, had a pickup truck behind him and a car that you couldn't see the license plate because, hey, let's go. Brandon was his license plate. And something jumped out at me as someone who you know actually is a truck driver, as someone who spent years doing this and had to go through the misery of, of going through another renewal of my CDL, which truck drivers, if you want to get mad about something, get mad about the fact that. You know, we've got to go every four years to get a terror risk assessment to prove that we're not terrorists, even though you have our fingerprints. And we've got to pay to get our fingers printed again and again and again and again. Go through an FBI back che background check to say, hey, you're, you're not a terrorist in an industry that you don't even need to know how to drive a stick anymore because all of the trucks are, manu are, are automatic. So you don't even need to be all that bright if, you, if the idea is to make us take tests to move hazardous material. Because we might drive it into something. Any idiot can do that. If you can fly a plane into something, you can easily drive a truck. There's something to be angry about. Oh, and I got my renewal, 120 bucks for the renew renewal of my license. That's on top of the 100 bucks that I spent on, on fingerprinting and all the other nonsense that comes along with it. There's something to be angry about. But Bob, Bob was tooling down the road at a cool 50 miles an hour and a 65. Uh, styling he was, waving. <laughs> he was having a high old time. But Bob was like a guy who, you know, nobody, nobody, nobody talked to in school and finally someone noticed he exists. Uh, Bob was just waving, smiling, happy. He was, he was enjoying the attention. Loving it. Loving it. Even though he was backing up traffic and people were not thrilled behind him. The thing that popped out at me is as we're driving, and I know this was a conscious decision on the part of Bob, because I, I think I understand how the angry old white guy thinks. Uh, because as I quoted, this is the angry old white guy grievance tour. Bob has lots of grievances. Uh, Bob's wife probably doesn't even listen to him. So he's got to get it out somewhere. So on the side of his truck, tooling down the road at 50 miles an hour, is how he does this. Uh, now, in his, to his defense, he only drove off the road only almost a couple of times. And that's okay. You know, you get a little older, you know, you know, it's, it's a little tougher. I, and, and I understand. But the thing that popped out at me was on the back of the, the trailer, I noticed, you know, right above the ICC bar where the uh, placard for the vehicle is, is placed, there was a dangerous placard. And for those of you who don't know anything about trucks, there are these placard holders on all four sides of the vehicle because you're supposed to placard a vehicle on all four sides if you're carrying hazardous material. Dangerous being one of those classes of, uh, of one of those classifications of multiple hazards, you know, like flammable and and and, and non-flammable stuff together, corrosive, and you know you could have a whole bunch of stuff in there. You just placarded dangerous, so you don't have to put one for each thing you have. He had it on just the rear. He chose not to put it on any of the other sides, just that one, kind of like sending a message that I'm dangerous. 
And so I tweeted today to the state police, and I go, hey, you know, I, I, I think you might want to check this. There's a problem here. Clearly, I don't think Bob has a CDL. Clearly, I don't think Bob's all that bright, uh, but I don't think he does. That and the fact that he didn't have DOT numbers on the door, which is another violation. But again, a guy owning a trucking company not knowing those are violations is not a problem. Things that he would fire his employees for, not a problem for Bob. Not a problem for someone who's entitled. Not a, a problem with someone who's privileged. Not a problem for an old, grievanced white guy. Because interestingly enough, he made it from all the way down from Scranton almost to Maryland, and not a cop pulled him over. Kind of got to wonder if that were you or me or, you know, heaven forbid, somebody else. But here's the old white guy tooling down the road at a cool 50 miles an hour. Happy as can be. While the world, and, and the goal of this, he even stated, the goal is to tie up traffic. The, the goal is to get attention. And Bob got attention. And as this trucker convoy comes from the West, and clogs up cities across the country. And good luck on you guys. I'm sure you're going to make lots of friends along the way. Uh, I know those people today were not happy. And I'm sure at the dinner table that they were late for because of Bob doing a cool 50 miles an hour. While everyone else on 83, and for those of you, I'm sure you've got a highway near you where the speed limit is 65, but the average speed is 90. Bob was doing a cool 50. Uh, they're a problem without four ways out. Again, not, not the brightest trucker in the lot. But he's going to D.C. And what I'm hoping, and this is what I'm hoping, I'm hoping he didn't find my tweet saying this idiot put the uh, placard on the back of his, his trailer in violation, and that's something he should get the $500 ticket for. I'm hoping he drives right past the White House, uh, right down you know, Constitution there, right around the block, and the D.C. police pull him over with like 10 of them because he's got hazardous material on a, on a restricted route. That would be fun. And that would make Bob's grievances even bigger uh, because each of those two things that I laid out, a pretty hefty fine. But Bob's a rich guy. It doesn't matter to him. And there's nobody to fire Bob because Bob won the birth lottery. He was one of the lucky ones. And that's the problem with where we are today. The people who are, who are the chaos merchants, the people who are, keep pushing this poison, they're the privileged ones. And they're doing a great job of inflaming those of us who have been working hard and trying to get ahead. They've done a great job of pitting us against each other so that they could have more. And this is what I saw today. I saw the grievance tour uh, with old angry white people driving down the road with Chinese-made flags that said F. Biden for all of our children to see. It's America. Sad days. I got lots to get to, lots to talk about. Love to hear your thoughts. 1-866-416-RICK, 1-866-416-7425. Going to take a quick break. Right back on the other side. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. of the show you've heard our labor history in two segments and you can hear them on the radio pretty much anywhere in the u.s labor history has never been more important than it is right now so here's what we'd like you to do tell a teacher tell a teacher that labor history is important and that they can get digestible two-minute lessons that are absolutely free free to download free to use free to share tell a teacher to go to the ricksmithshow.com backslash history and help us put labor back where it belongs in the classroom you know generations of american workers fought bled and died to build the american way of life it's our job to keep their stories alive go tell a teacher that we're here to help them do just that find us at the ricksmithshow.com backslash history today
Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, interesting question. Got a question. Of the living secretaries of state, and there are several, uh, you got Madeleine Albright, Condi Rice, uh, William Burns, Hillary Clinton, John Kerry, Thomas Shannon Jr., Rex Tillerson, John Sullivan, Mike Pompeo, Daniel Bennett Smith, Anthony Blinken. These are all past secretaries of state. Now, granted, uh, Burns, Shannon, Sullivan, and Smith were short timers, a couple of days, a couple of hours in some case. But all of the, of all of them, which one do you think praised Vladimir Putin? Uh, you think it was Madeleine Albright? You think you know, her during the Clinton years? You think she was? She thinks she had to come out and say, "No, no, Putin was a good old guy. We had high old times." We and the Clinton guys. You think Condi came out and said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I can see that." You think Hillary? <laughs> you think Hillary? Uh, considering that that Putin stole an election from her. Uh, what about John Kerry? No. How about Tillerson? The Tillerson? Any any takers? No. The answer is Mike Pompeo. Uh, M- Mike Pompeo, the guy, a former. Secretary of State, the only living Secretary of State to praise to praise Vladimir Putin and to criticize President Biden. That is the Republican Party. But here's the thing. Should you am I surprised? No, of course not. It's who Pompeo is. Because look, of the living US presidents, did you hear W coming out and say, yeah, you know, when I looked into his eyes and I saw his soul and we drove around his little VW. Oh, those are those are tingly days. Did you hear him say that? Of course not. Your Clinton say anything positive about Putin? Obama? No, no, just Donald Trump. And of course it was Donald Trump, because uh, according to Donald, you know, Putin's a genius. Savvy. Pretty savvy. Very savvy. They're going to keep the peace all right. The biggest, greatest peace force ever. This is our guy. And I watched as the Fox News folks and the right-wing outrage machine, the chaos merchants on talk radio went on and on about how wonderful Donald Trump is. Oh, this would have never happened under Donald's watch. No, no, we would have just handed it to him. I'm waiting for Trump to send him a send Putin a housewarming gift. And what's interesting is you, you listen to the Tucker Carlsons, who came out and said, quote, it may be worth asking yourself, since it's getting pretty serious, what is this really about? Why do I hate Putin so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he ever threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? I saw this and I'm going, what are you talking about? Can you, I, one of those moments where you go, growing up during the Cold War, growing up as a kid, you know, literally underneath a desk, because we thought somehow those Catholic school desks were going to save us from mutually assured destruction. I, I can't imagine that kid going, yeah, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to side with Putin, former KGB officer. Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. I, I come to this moment of, you know, when did the Republican Party make the conversion? Now, remember, these are the people who, you know, salute the flag. In fact, we went through Rick Scott's, you know, 11-point plan, the 31-page glossy brochure on how we're going to love America, uh, bending at the knee to Mother Russia. And I saw a great cartoon today. Uh, you, you know, during the Cold War when I was a kid, you saw, you know, the elephant and the donkey sitting on one side of the table and the bear, Russia, on the other. And now you've got the donkey on one side, Democrats, and the elephant and the bear on the other because they're married up. Because the Republican Party has sold their soul. And the propaganda machine that has been infiltrated by, by Russian money, the outrage folks that I listened today on the radio to, basically asking that same question that Tucker Carlson, well, what would they ever do to us? Can't we all just get along? 
They're just helping those people. You know, those poor people who are being tortured by the evil Ukrainians? And the sad reality is, <laughs> it's going to work. I, I believe it is going to work on a large segment of the GOP. You know, a couple years ago when we saw those two idiots walking around with, I'd rather be Russian than a Democrat t-shirts on. You know, people were like, wow, that's, that's so outrageous. You know, they're just they're just they're just trying to be, you know, outrageous. They're just trying to get attention. They're just trying to, to go viral. No, they were speaking for their generation. They were speaking their outrage. This is about authoritarianism versus democracy. I don't like Putin for the same reason I don't like Donald Trump. These are authoritarian dictator types. I believe in democracy, and we're in this moment. Do you believe in democracy or do you not? Do you believe Do you believe in the will of we the people or not? Now you go, but Rick, hey, you know, there's a lot of we the people who you know, they want, they want, they want to be on the side of Putin. And you're right. And and that's what scares me. They're willing to give up freedom and control to someone like Trump. They're willing to have an authoritarian leader. And am I surprised by it? No. This is we've been moving this way. You, know, you go back to the Molly Ivan's comment about Pat Buchanan's presidential speeches in 92, where you know, she said it they were much better in their original German. There's always been that sliver of the Republican Party, that far right sliver. They've always been there. The difference is, is now they've taken over. And they're heavily funded heavily funded and deeply entrenched in our military, deeply entrenched in our police departments, this kind of, well, the kind of Putin thinking that, that we're getting. This strong man, authoritarian kind of mindset. Man's man. You hear it from the Republicans all the time, which is why they're so fixated on, on attacking people of alternative lifestyles, which is why they're so fixated about what people do in their bedrooms, which is why they're so fixated on controlling what, what our kids learn, why they're so fixated on controlling everything that everyone else does while talking about freedom and liberty. I mean, that's the most, <laughs> that's the most laughable of all. You know, Bob, the truck, the imitation truck driver, uh, who, you know, <laughs> 50 miles an hour in a 65. There ain't a truck driver on this planet who's doing 50 in a 65 unless you're looking for trouble. And that's who these people are, just folks looking for trouble. Because it's their right. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you my buddy Bob there, I'll bet you my buddy Bob says it's his right to do 50 miles an hour in a 65. It's God-given right. Even though everyone behind him, angry as can be. That's how you win, friends, Bob. That's how you win friends. If you're just joining us, make sure you check out the podcast. You can get that at therixsmithshow.com or wherever you get your podcasts. From iTunes to iHeart, Podbean to Stitcher, and everywhere in between. We're going to take a quick break when we come back to talk a little bit more about what's going on in the Ukraine with someone who, who knows a lot about it, a lot more than I do, uh, which, is why, which is why we're going to talk to him. Quick break. Right back after this. Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1969. That was the day black food workers went on strike at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Their strike intersected many points central to the social upheaval of the period, including the rights of public sector workers. Besides extremely low wages, workers complained of racial abuse and discrimination on the job. When the administration ignored their demands, the cafeteria workers sat down at the tables and refused to return to the kitchens. Black women workers like Mary Smith and Elizabeth Brooks organized protests and rallies to build public support on and off of campus. As the strike wore on, many students rallied to their defense. The black student movement was the first campus group to support the cafeteria workers. 
Noting the lag of desegregation on Southern campuses and in the South generally, black students added their own demands to those of the workers. They included the expansion of black student aid programs and black study programs. Clashes escalated between students at Lenore Hall a few weeks later when opposing white students attacked integrated groups of students sympathetic to the strike, forcing the closure of the cafeteria hall. Governor Robert Scott ordered the National Guard on standby. Finally, the workers formed a union and won many of their demands. This benefited 5,000 other state employees as well. But a month later, the University of North Carolina administration betrayed them by contracting out the food service. Many were laid off or fired for union activities. By the end of the year, the now AFSCME organized workforce struck again over many of the same issues. When renewed student strike support was threatened, management quickly caved, and the strike ended in victory. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. In 1972, I was part of a nationwide campaign that came close to getting the U.S. Senate to reject Earl Butts, Richard Nixon's choice for Secretary of Agriculture. A coalition of grassroots farmers, consumers, and public interest organizations teamed up with progressive senators to undertake the almost impossible challenge of defeating the cabinet nominee. The 51 to 44 Senate vote was so close because we were able to expose butts as, well, as butt ugly. We brought the abusive power of corporate agribusiness into the public consciousness for the first time. We had won a moral victory, but it turned out to be a curse and a blessing. First, the curse. Butts had risen to prominence in the world of agriculture by devoting himself to the corporate takeover of the global food economy. He openly promoted the preeminence of middlemen food manufacturers over family farmers. Agriculture is no longer a way of life, he barked. It's a business. He instructed farmers to get big or get out and proceeded to shove tens of thousands of them out by promoting an export-based, corporate-run food economy. Adapt, he warned, or die. The ruination of farms and rural communities, Butts added, releases people to do something useful in our society. This is Jim Hightower saying, the curse of Butts, however, spun off a blessing. Small farmers and food artisans practically threw up at the resulting twinkieization of America's food. They were sickened that nature's own contribution to human culture was being turned into another plasticized product of corporate profiteers. They threw themselves into creating and sustaining a viable alternative, linking locally with consumers, environmentalists, community activists, marketers, and others. The Good Food Rebellion has since sprouted, spread, and blossomed from coast to coast. To find farmers markets and other expressions of this movement right where you live, go to localharvest.org. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So UN Security Council, they've got evidently a meeting, uh, just scheduled an, an emergency meeting on Ukraine this evening. Um, and the thing that gets me is, you know, what took you so long? I mean, seriously, you didn't see this coming? Uh, now, the the a new poll out by the AP and NORC, uh, they find that just 26 of percent of Americans want to have the U.S. play a major role in what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, 52% want the U.S. to play a minor role. 20% say none at all. And I would say the 20% none at all, it's an interesting number. Uh, those, I would I would bet the dyed-in-the-wool, hardcore uh, Trumpkins, the J.D. Vances of the world, the folks who, no, we shouldn't do anything. Just let Putin go where he wants. Uh, they're the trouble. Actually, I'm a little surprised that's not 30%, which is what I put at the, the hardcore Trump base. But you know, we'll see where this goes. Uh, here to share some, some thoughts on this, give some perspective and some historical background, I've asked Trigvi Olson to come talk with us. Trigvi is the principal over at Viking Strategies, also a senior advisor at the Lincoln Project. Trigvi, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me on, Rick. So Interesting times. Yeah, I'm surprised it's taken so long for the emergency meeting. Um, well, I think this is one, you know, they've been having a few of them The this one, this one was called by the Ukrainians because Putin wasn't picking up the phone when Zelensky was trying to call him today. I mean, that's shocking, right? Because, um, 
given what he's about to do. Right. But I think, you know, the one the the UN has a lot of things about it that are relatively pointless. I do think the one thing that's interesting is that when they had the meeting the other day, you know, the Chinese were not as gung ho as they might have seemed to be. But um, yeah, it's 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 just a bad situation. Yeah, I don't think the Chinese care. I don't think they. I think they're looking at it to where if we allow Putin to go and take Ukraine over, if we don't do anything, if we or if we act very very uh, sheepishly, uh, that's going to give yeah. them carte blanche to go and take Taiwan. Uh, to take over the islands in the South China Sea and to basically roll over, you know, that entire region of the world. Uh, so for me, this is a double kind of situation where you can't give Putin the, the OK to go and get the old gang back together and recreate the Soviet Union. But you also also don't want China doing it either. No. And, and, and think about think about a guy like Josh Hawley. Right. His whole thing's been we why do we care about the Russians? We should care about China. He thinks that G. And he, he should be smart enough. He's either he's either the dumbest guy to ever go to the places he went to school or he knows better, which you kind of got a Senate candidate on the Republican side in Ohio is like that. But he he's constantly talking about China, and yet there's no logic. If he thinks that the Chinese aren't watching what Putin's going to do, to your point, um, he's crazy. He knows that, right? Yeah. If, if, if we don't do stand together with our allies and make some serious consequences no, they're going to do that that's what autocrats do it, it gets worse and, and that's an important word uh, autocrat because i think we're in a moment and i think this is this is not new i'm not magellan discovering new lands this is a moment in this country where we have to decide do we believe in democracy or autocracy we have to decide which direction we're going to allow the world to go and look i don't like being the world's policeman but at the end of the day i would rather it uh, be us than Putin or, or Xi Jinping. I mean, that's just the world we're in. Well, and you know what? One of the things that, that, that I've talked about a fair amount, and I never really thought, you know, I spent a lot of years working for an organization that was run by Senator McCain, and we worked together with Democrats. We worked together with the labor union guys at the Solidarity Center to, to help people in Ukraine that were trying to build a democracy. Um, Cross party lines. And and one of the things that you've come to understand quickly with autocrats is they're all about fear. That's what Donald Trump does. That's what Putin's trying to do. That's what January 6th was all about. That's what bombing Ukraine's going to be all about. They want to make us afraid. And, and democracy is all about faith in each other. It's not about, you know, what we disagree on. It's about me believing that you have the country's best interest at heart. I do too. Um, and, and that we can have honest disagreements and we're going to agree to have elections at regular intervals and all the rest. And it really is a competition between autocracy and democracy, between faith in each other and fear of each other. And, and we got to rally together. Yeah. Right now, that's the only game because we won't be able to disagree, you know, in the way that we've known on things that we disagree about if we have if we don't have democracy no we're heading so. sadly down that path every day it's getting much worse i believe and this is just another another sign uh that shows how far we have veered off of reality because as i asked yesterday when did we go from mr gorbachev tear down this wall uh to a president going uh vladimir putin's a genius and and very smart and savvy i I'm not sure. Like I said, I, I pinned that moment with Pat Buchanan in 92 as the awakening moment. Uh, but I'm not sure when the full flip happened. Uh, but I, I think it was just before Trump. And I think he just he made it OK. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think I think, you know, there's a there's a trap that Trump world is trying to draw us into. You know, you're seeing all these guys, Richard Grinnell, you know, Nikki Haley was doing it today. They're trying to say. You know, well, Trump, you know, Russia didn't do anything when Trump was in power. You know, this must be that Biden, Biden's weakness. The truth of the matter is they know that they wouldn't be doing anything different if they were sitting in the White House than what Joe Biden's doing, which is uniting our allies, creating consequences. They wouldn't be putting troops in Ukraine. It's not a NATO country, right? They don't want to start World War III. Um, they wouldn't be doing anything different, but they're constantly throwing that out there because that's where they want the conversation. 
when in reality we should be pushing back and saying you guys are standing with one of the most murderous notorious thugs of the 21st century who who's going down a path to join guys like joe stalin and and others of the 20 20th century yeah. and so like that's where we've got to take the argument to them it's 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 a zero-sum game you're either on team democracy or you're with the with team autocracy putin and trump's team no the, and that's the and, democratic and no, message that's the democrats yeah. message just this november it is that simple uh that and republicans hate working people right now that's it's my view you're listening to the rick smith show we're here with trig v olson uh, Trig V is the principal there at Viking Strategies, also a senior advisor at the Lincoln Project. Check out the work the folks do over at the Lincoln Project, uh, projectlincoln.com, I believe, the website. Um, if you're just joining us, make sure you download the podcast. You don't want to miss what Trig V's got to say here. So, you know, I'm looking at what, what Putin said. He's not, he's not really, he doesn't want to get the old gang back together. He doesn't want to recreate the Soviet Union. I don't know that I believe that. Uh, I got to think a former KGB officer who's had a grievance his entire life about the breakup of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall and all of that, and the end of communism. I got to think that's a sore spot. So I got to think that's part of his legacy. We got to get the old band back together. And, and you know, taking over Ukraine is a huge part of it. Uh, Belarus without firing a shot, that's got to be a part of it. Shouldn't that also be part of this message? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Think about, you know, I think you were alluding to this uh, either t today or yesterday. You know, look at the people that are coming out on his side. Nicaragua, Cuba. Uh, it, it, he doesn't. He can say he doesn't want to put the band together. It, it's the same suspects. It's the same guys. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, if, if, if our great-grandparents fought the battle between fascism and freedom, and our grandparents' generational battle was between communism and capitalism. Our generation, I think, and you and I are about the same age, you know, it stinks that we got the Cold War back. Explaining that to your kids kind of sucks. Yeah. But, but our battle, our generational battle, and maybe theirs, is going to be autocracy versus democracy. And, yeah. and, and that battle starts right here at home. Absolutely. They're taking it to us. And, and the thing that, that, that's frustrating to me, and, and as you've pointed out, trying to have these conversations with our kids, trying to explain to them that, you know, we lived with a fear in school, too. Granted, their fear is that some idiot's going to come in with a gun and shoot the place up, which is a much more real fear than, than probably we had of, of the old mad mentality of mutual assured destruction, that at any minute now someone's going to be pushing buttons and lobbing nukes on our head. But to explain to them that that's the world that we were in and that was something that united us as a country and to see right now this huge split. And like I said earlier, there was this cartoon that I saw of, you know, you had the elephant and the, and the donkey on one side of the table and the bear on the other. That was the old Cold War. The new one, the elephant moved to the other side. Yeah, it's crazy. It, it really. And you wonder, you wonder. And, and this is something, you know, every. I know you have some contentious races in Ohio. I'm from Wisconsin, so we have the same thing going on, right? Um, every single person who's listening, every single person around the country, this is true, but every single one of these guys needs to get asked on the Republican side, whether they're running for the state house or the White House. Do you do you stand with Donald Trump that Vladimir Putin's a genius? And if if you know they put them in the spot, and if they say that, then we know where they stand. Because they're not going to, if they think that, they don't have any belief in elections. They have no interest but other than to take power yeah. uh, now, and, and maintain it. Now, as we were talking before, during the break, you, you'd, you'd said that your wife's from Lithuania. You have, you, you spent years in that region of the world. What Putin is trying to sell, what we're being sold from our right wing uh, chaos merchants, is that there are poor, vulnerable people in Ukraine that are being abused and that all Putin is doing is simply you know, sending support. He's he's a peacekeeper. He's a good guy. You know, did, did he ever call you a racist? Did he ever try to get you fired? No, of course not. Why would he do anything bad? Which is what we're being sold. Is, is there any reality to that argument that, you know, there's just you know, this 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 Ukrainian government that's cra you know cracking down on people that Putin has to go in and rescue them and keep them safe and save them? Is that is that an actual argument? No, I mean, there's there's no there's no. No, not at all. I mean, if you watch, the entire thing is contrived. It's This is classic KGB mentality, create the provocation, 
create false flag and 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 undertake that it what ukraine was becoming and i i is you know what it was clear to me when we were in lithuania i was in lithuania in the summer um what was clear about ukraine is it was becoming sort of a mini shiny city on a hill in that region it was slowly becoming winning democracy belarusians who had been in the streets protesting uh, you know others who are calling for democracy russians um they were flocking to Kiev. It's a threat to Putin. He he feared that, and as a KGB guy, um, this is the way up. he executes things. Yeah. I, and you know, the thing that people have to understand is, guys like that. Most of us in the United States never end up encountering people like that. But for him, you know, it's either his way or shoot you. Right. You know, and 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 uh, what he understands is power. And, you know, we need to we have to stand up to him. We have to show we're not afraid because that's what he wants. He wants us to be afraid. As do our authoritarians here. Let me ask you this, Trigby, because, you know, I'm, I, I was I was spending today. I was, I was reading a whole bunch of stories on Ukraine and going back and, and rereading stories about, you know, Crimea and, and that and, you know, what Obama did, because, of course, you know, this has become a black and white issue. Uh, and, and, you know, anyone who's thoughtful understands that n virtually nothing is absolute black or white. No one's absolutely wrong or right on any issue. Uh, although that's what the Twitter sphere keeps telling me, that it was all Obama's fault. Uh, Ukraine's been a mess for kind of a while. And, and there's been this kind of, you know, this, this kind of back and forth where, you know, I, I, I don't know how to explain it to where we we get an accurate way of, of kind of understanding it. Is there, is there a way that you can explain it that maybe folks will be able to not just take that black and white view? Um, does that make any sense? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, so Ukraine, Ukraine, and this is true of Belarus to a degree, they're, because of where they're located geographically, they've always kind of been transition lands in between east and, and west, right? It's just sort of where they sit um it also has meant that when when europe was going through a period of having massive conflict you had napoleon and germans and russians you had lots of people marching through those places um and and so the evolution of ukraine because it's a very it's kind of a crossroads place um the evolution of ukraine and the desire of 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 countries particularly the russians uh, but the Ottomans too, to to hold it and dominate it, is something that's been true for a long time. But Ukraine, you know, Putin has known uh, there is no Soviet Union without Ukraine. There is no, you know, um, it just wasn't going to happen. So yeah. you know, in a way, Ukraine, they're just they're sitting in a position where where they're located becomes strategically important, particularly for the bad guys. Yeah. No, I, um, and that's a good way. Of, that's a good way of explaining it. Let me ask you this, because you know, Trump said yesterday, uh, Biden has done nothing. Some of the comments I heard on on rage on rage radio today were, you know, Biden's doing nothing. He's ineffective. Uh, let's let's talk about the sanctions. Are they enough? I mean, some of the reports I saw, you know, said, you know, they were a thud today. Um, what, what kind of a grade do you give how the president has reacted and what kind of you know, sanctions have begun. Uh, what are your thoughts? So, the, you know, as I said before, I think um, there isn't a single Republican that if they were in office, other than completely appeasing Trump and saying, here, take it. Um, there isn't a single person that would be in the, if you'd have had Ronald, if Ronald Reagan were in office, he would be doing what Joe Biden is doing right now, right? Like. He would be gathering our allies together and saying we have to be strong and confront this. We have to create economic consequences. The sanctions that they put in place, as best I can tell, it's a first step. But I will say the big ball to drop in some ways for Putin to get his attention, the first one was the Germans canceling Nord Stream. Uh, um, the other thing is that Putin fears um, beyond democracy is he fears a bunch of elites around him. They have started sanctioning those people. Um, there's conversations in the UK that they may go after their property, you know, the yachts. Um, those are real consequences because those are ones that can 
massively impact. And, you know, they're happening because America is leading. America is best and, and always has been, whether it was John Kennedy or Ronald Reagan, Republican or Democrats, when we've led. And we've let, been able to lead because they're, you know, to your point, it was the donkey and the Republican sitting across from the bear. And, and that's what Putin, Putin is betting the house that our division will become division in NATO and he'll be able to get away with this and, and probably a lot more. So last really. question I've got for you on this, because you, you brought up the division and this is where I wanted to end. You know, if I'm if I'm Putin looking at this country right now, uh, I see I see truckers, you know, the truckers convoy, even though it was one guy you know, driving down the road right. here in this area. Um, I see I see division. I see uh, angst. I see, you know, people with F Joe Biden flags flying outside of their house. I see that division from the outside. I see the, the kind of racist and the kind of homophobic and the kind of all of this stuff that is as pitting us against one another. And I see this as a moment uh, to, to be able to do whatever I want because there won't be a consensus. Do you think that mm -hmm. had much to do with his, uh, with his decision to go this route? Because, you know, again, you, you alluded to it earlier. The right is saying if Donald Trump were in office, Putin would have never done this. I disagree. I think we would have just given it to him, but that's a whole other argument. Um, do you think, do you think that, that visual of our division led to this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as a, you know, on one, on January 6th, I was actually in Europe um, and I was in Lithuania. We happened to be over there. And, and I will tell you, you know, across Europe, they're like, oh my God, what, this is, this is bad, really bad. If people go online and want to do a little bit of your own research, Google what world leaders were saying that with what they were seeing on one six. That's the kind of thing that doesn't happen in America. It's the kind of thing that sometimes happens in their countries, but it's what made us exceptional. And you want to know what, what's made America great for all these years, for the people who that appeals to. It's the fact that, that our democracy was solid when it came to outside the United States and we stood as one. That's what has, and, and so, you know, if we're going to recoup that, um, we have to we have to start solving this and 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 we have to we have to for those of us who are concerned about it we have to be putting to people you know do you stand with putin and trump and and those people on team autocracy or are you on team democracy because we can agree on that if we disagree on tax rates or whatever yep. right because no, no. those things we're not going to have an argument about be able to have an argument about them if that if that side wins we're just not you're absolutely right. Trigby, I appreciate you taking some time for us. I hope as this, I'm sure this is going to continue. I hope you'll come back and, and share some more with us. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime, Rick. Good stuff. Appreciate it. Um, Trigby Olson, principal there at Viking Strategy, senior advisor to the Lincoln Project. Um, you know, this is, this is one of those moments. It's one of those moments that you have to, we better figure out how to, how to, how to bring this all back into somewhere near the, um, near the same line somewhere near, you know, something, uh, you know, if, if not in, on the same field, at least in the same arena, because, you know, as, as these authoritarians look in at us and China's watching, uh, they don't, they don't care to get involved. I think they'd happy to see us. They'd be thrilled to see us in, in another foreign entanglement, uh, expending our resources and then weakening, weakening our ability to react to anything and still buying their cheap plastic garbage and being dependent on them. This is like one of the worst moments for this to happen because, you know, I've been saying for years, we need to rebuild manufacturing. If we get into some kind of a conflict, do we have the, the manufacturing capabilities to keep up? Will we get the little smart chips to make our smart things smart, especially our smart bombs? And will the American people put up with it? I look at how they're reacting now to a little bit of inconvenience. I, we're not, we're not the greatest generation. Steal up seems to be the response. Uh, although I did see a very interesting story today, uh, and it was one of those that that's supposed to make you. Um, I, I'm not sure if it's supposed to make you angry, it's supposed to make you afraid. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but um, uh, the Telegraph in the UK reported on the fact that Russia has deployed mobile crematoriums 
And, and I, I'm guessing the message in this is that they're just going to go along the road. You know, whoever they kill, they're just going to evaporate. Uh, they can. You know, that was the word that they used. I'm not making that up. Uh, this vehicle mounted crematorium can evaporate one human body at a time and has been seen trailing Russian forces. So they're just going to scoop people up. Done. But he's protecting people. He's a peacekeeper. Protecting those people. And the thing is, is look, I, I'm with the majority of Americans. I don't want to get in, 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 a, in a long, drawn-out conflict. Uh, I don't want us to be, you know, massively involved in this. But there's the flip side of this. And, you know, both Trig V and I talked about it. We both got kids. Uh, there's that mindset. If there's trouble, if there's pain and suffering, if there's chaos, let it be in my time so that my children don't have to suffer through it. So that they can lead a better life. Let us not leave a worse planet. And, and again, I go back to what I talked about last night. I remember the excitement, the, the opportunity, the the thought that we were gonna we were gonna we were going to be able to experience the peace dividend. I mean, how wonderful did that sound? It was the peace dividend. We fought this long war, we suffered, we struggled, we sacrificed. It was going to be great now. Communism, the, the dreaded enemy, has fallen. They're now going to be like us. And, well, they took us to the extreme. Because the oligarchs immediately took over everything. And a good old American capitalism, we had our folks go in to make sure that they didn't leave anything behind, no crumbs. So the working people in, in Russia, the working people here, and now the working people in Ukraine are going to suffer because of it. All because the very wealthy, uh, they have figured out how to line their pockets and control industry after industry. Where does this take us? I don't know. It's got to come back to you and me. It's got to come back to us healing these divisions. Because like I said, if I'm looking at us from the outside, if I'm looking through the snow globe and I'm looking at the U.S., I see lots of fissures. I see opportunities if I'm Putin to continue to divide with his digital army who did a masterful job in 16, like it or not, believe it or not, they did a masterful job in 16 to swing the election to Trump. They did. And, you know, unfortunately for Trump, he was such a bad president that they couldn't do it again. Not that they didn't try, but they tried to do it again. And now you've got the same people saying, well, you know, if Donald Trump were president, you know, Vladimir Putin would be afraid of him. Well, the problem is I remember Helsinki. The only problem is I, I remember not a tough guy, not the, you know, Mr. Macho, not the, hey, we're going to we're going to put him in their place. No, I remember a guy who. Very docile. Someone who went into a move, a, a meeting. And, and ripped up the notes. How bad was that meeting? How bad? That's my question. I've got lots of them, uh, but we're going to take a quick break. Right back after this on the other side. If you're just joining us, make sure you grab the podcast. My conversation with Trig V. Olson was fantastic. You don't want to miss that. Uh, get your podcasts anywhere you get them. iTunes to iHeart, Podbean to Stitcher, all over the place. Wherever you get yours, get it there. Quick break, right back. Scientists predict the change in climate could mean more extreme conditions. Now it's raising attention to how the weather will impact our economy. Weather disasters impacted one in 10 homes in the U.S. last year. Biden Interior Department halts new oil and gas leases in legal fight over costs to climate. Plus, there are homes of countless natural and cultural wonders that, uh, that should be conserved for all to enjoy today, tomorrow, and for generations to come. President Biden unveils historic $1 billion in funding for Great Lakes cleanup. All of those historic stories and more straight ahead from Bradblog.com. I'm Brad Friedman. And I'm Desi Doyen. Stand by for six minutes of independent green news, politics, analysis, and snarky comment. These are not only investments we're making the Great Lakes, 
We're rebuilding America. We're going to invest in America and build a better America than we found. Well, that shouldn't be hard. This is your Green News Report. Okay, Desi Doyen, we're trying to rebuild a better America, but it is going to be costly at this rate, unfortunately. Yes, yes, it will. And that's because extreme weather disasters are extremely expensive. Extreme weather disasters affected one in every 10 homes in the U.S. last year and caused nearly $57 billion in property damage in a single year. That's according to a new report by property analytics firm CoreLogic. They found that in 2021 alone, 13 major disasters from hurricanes to tornadoes, wildfires, and winter storms impacted 15 million homes. And more than 40% of Americans live in a county that was struck by a climate-related disaster in the last year. Well, we could do something about that, but then the oil and gas companies wouldn't get all of that free money. Repeat extreme weather disasters are also raising the cost of homeowners insurance. The findings drive home the devastating toll of disasters that are becoming more common and more costly because of climate change. A different study has, for the first time, identified how changes in rainfall patterns induced by global warming dampen economic growth. I see what you did there. Dampen economic growth. Very uh -huh. good. Uh -huh. A known consequence of man-made global warming has been the observed increase in extreme rainfall events worldwide. Researchers publishing in the journal Nature found that precipitation shocks, both deluges and droughts, significantly reduced productivity across multiple sectors and industries from transportation to agriculture and service industries, and that in turn created a drag on an entire region's economic growth. They warn that current economic models probably don't realistically capture future costs associated specifically with climate change rainfall and likely underestimate costs that climate change will impose on human society. Climate change rainfall, kind of like those 10 inches of rain that they received in uh, Rio, Brazil, in three hours last week? Exactly. Oh. Oh. In other news, the Biden Interior Department will indefinitely pause all federal oil and gas leases and permits in the wake of a Trump-appointed judge's ruling that blocked the federal government from using a key climate metric known as the social cost of carbon. The social cost of carbon is used to calculate the real costs of climate change, and it's used in a range of government decisions, from pollution regulations to permits for new oil, gas, or coal extraction. But the Trump judge just... Try to ignore that? The Trump judge struck it down. <laughs> the suit was brought by Republican state attorneys general seeking to increase fossil fuel extraction, but in an ironic twist, the consequence from the judge's ruling blocking that metric, at least initially, is that the administration will freeze all decisions about new federal oil and gas drilling and halt oil and gas lease sales and new permits on public lands indefinitely. <laughs> Finally, it's going to allow the most significant restoration of the Great Lakes in the history of the Great Lakes. President Biden was in Lorain, Ohio, late last week to unveil $1 billion in funding from the infrastructure law that will go toward cleanup and restoration of the Great Lakes. The bulk of the funding is targeted to restoring 25 sites across six Great Lakes states that the Environmental Protection Agency 30 years ago designated as severely degraded areas of concern that have been damaged by decades of industrial and agricultural pollution. The unprecedented restoration funding will address water quality, harmful algae blooms, invasive species, pollution and habitat degradation, and will go to upgrading infrastructure, vital for shipping, transportation, outdoor recreation, and clean drinking water. Biden noted that each cleanup project will generate jobs and that will ripple across the state's economies. Every dollar we spend cleaning up the Great Lakes generates between 3 and $4 in economic benefit. That's a fact. And it's a really good investment. We're also showing that growing the economy and creating jobs can go hand in hand with protecting the environment, not decimating it, meeting the moment on climate change. And it's all starting in Lorraine? Yep. Sweet. For much more on all of these stories and the ones we couldn't get to today, check out our website at greennews.bradblog.com.
Are you tired of think tank approved corporate news and commentary? Are you tired of CEOs telling you what to think, who to hate, and who to vote for? Well, welcome to the Rick Smith Show. We don't take orders from some boardroom, and we don't do focus groups or talking points. We don't work for them, and we never will. I'm Rick Smith, and I work for you. Join us daily at thericksmithshow.com and download the podcast and never miss a minute. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So it's being reported that guns, yes, guns, they've overtaken uh, the death rate of even people in cars. Uh, So guns are now worse than cars and killing people. Uh, The leading cause of death by trauma. And you go, yeah, of course, because we've got more guns in this country than we've got people. It's not surprising. And you've got every fetishist with not just one or two, but a whole arsenal. And look, I'm not a gun grabber. I'm not someone who's, you know, we, we, should, we should not have guns anywhere. I'm one who says, you know, maybe a little personal responsibility. And maybe we hold people more accountable for doing dumb stuff. Especially the kind of, you know, insanity that we've been seeing lately about you know, crazy people wanting to overthrow the government. Whew. Wow. Uh, now, here's the thing. If you live in public life, you got to worry about this stuff. And, and we had talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were supposed to have Ohio Representative uh, Casey Weinstein on the program. And he said, hey, you know, uh, I got to bail out. We've got a bunch of crazy people in front of our house. We're, you know, taking taking home care of the home front. Uh, which I said, no, dude, you got to do what you got to do. Take care of your family. Uh, that's why I've asked his wife, Amy Weinstein, to come talk with us. Amy is an associate, Amanda Weinstein. She's an associate professor at the Department of Economics uh, at the University of Akron. She's also the co-host of the most fabulous podcast out there, uh, Suburban Women Problem Podcast. You can get that right next to mine somewhere, uh, anywhere from iTunes to iHeart to Podbean to Stitcher and all over. But Amanda, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me. So walk me through this. Um, You know, I understand that there was a point at which your husband bailed on us uh, because you had crazy people out in front of your house. Yeah, that was interesting. It was just one Sunday morning, walked by, and I started to notice a bunch of men with, you know, don't tread on me flags. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I wonder where they're going. And I went to go get my husband. Like, I think maybe there's um, something going on outside, like a MAGA rally. And he's like, where are they going? And we look, and all of a sudden we go, uh, they're coming to our house of all of the places they're going they're going to our house right now and so it was really quite shocking that they would come visit us on a sunday afternoon why 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 you're such wonderful people why would they come and try and harass and intimidate you that was kind of the shocking part we we're like man he is part of the minority party here i think if there's anyone you want to try and influence to do something probably he's not the most influential um but we even had our neighbors or a neighbor ended up going out to talk to him like, hey, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? And they're like, well, you know, we're Christian veterans and we want him to do better. And she was like, great. What would you like him to do? And they were like, I don't know. Let yeah. me ask my leader. And the leader came over. What do you want him to do better with? I don't know. And we're like, what are you talking about? Like first rule of a protest, have an ask. They didn't even have an ask. Or, or a demand. I mean, you know, not even yeah, an ask. Nothing. I mean, if you're if you're going to take your Sunday and and waste it, you know, harassing somebody in front of their house, at least have a point. And and this is the weird thing, um, because I go through this a lot. Uh, I know a lot of people who you know they they're angry about everything, and mm. you ask them, okay, so what do we, what are we talking about? And all you get is platitudes: freedom, liberty, you know, God, country, you know, uh, Jesus, That's guns, exactly and babies. Right. You know, crazy stuff. And you go, um, how about, you know, something a little more concrete, something a little more tangible, something more that we can get our hands around other than these giant ideas that you don't clearly understand or, or, or know what you want out of? How about we start something small? That's exactly right. They're just angry. And I'm like, I think what you really need is a therapist. And that's not my husband. So did you see them? I see. I think my wife would have broken, broken out the cookies because uh, she makes cookies for everything. Uh, the, the snowplow oh. guy goes by, he gets cookies. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, because I think you got to kill people like that with, with kindness. I, I think I would have gone out and sat with them. I may have even put on a red hat and walked with them. 
I know. Yeah. So we actually called the cops. So this is like hot off the heels for the January 6th insurrection. It's a little, it's a little too close for us. And we were like, I don't know what these people are here for. And so we're like, we should call the cops just to make sure someone responsible is out here. And the cops were like, do not go out there. We don't know who these people are. Uh, and we're like, okay. And then I actually had an Instacart order. So weird things go through your mind when stuff like this happens too. And all I remember talking to him, I was like, how do I get my Instacart order? <laughs> I don't know. They're like, lady, just open your garage. Yeah. Or just go to the grocery store, which is what I do. I'm, I guess I'm old <laughs> school. Um, but here's the thing. And, and look, you, you, you point to an interesting thing. They're angry. And, and I understand their anger. Uh, I understand the anger of, of working class people who have been screwed over by a system that has rewarded wealth. You know, we're talking now in these last couple of days about, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the end of the communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and and H.W. Bush talking about the, the peace dividend we were going to all be able to enjoy uh, because we we're going to be able to cut military spending and finally start to invest in education and health care and infrastructure and all of the things that we, we sacrificed and, and, and didn't get because, hey, we're fighting communism. The peace dividend got robbed. We got ripped off. It went to creating the largest billionaire class in the history of civilization, and we got cheated. And look, we're angry now. We look back and go, we got screwed, and I get that. But this isn't the answer. Harassing people on a Sunday, probably not the answer over, well, you don't have a clue. Uh, so the question I have is, in looking at this, how do we solve some of that anger by you know, maybe moving to an economy that works for us? Maybe? Thought? I think that's a great point. So I think a lot of what we tended to ignore is that a lot of when even our, so we tend to look at the stock market. I don't know why we look at the stock market and say, Hey, the stock market's doing great. Aren't we all doing great? And the truth is, no, we're not all doing great just because the stock market does great. And the stock market actually doesn't represent our entire economy. It's one measure of a very specific part of our economy, which are large corporations. And so what you don't see when even like stock market prices are going up is you don't see what that means in a more, I think about this as like across the country, right? So when New York's doing well, if Wall Street's doing well, if Texas and Dallas is doing well, you don't necessarily see, well, what's happening, you know, where I am in Akron, Ohio, in Cleveland, Ohio. And what you don't see is when we have this economic growth, sometimes it happens on the backs of other people. And that's what we've seen with a lot of our economic growth. It's happened on the backs of other people. When we see companies with record profits because they are investing in things like automation, what we see is higher GDP. We see higher stock prices. But what that also means is someone's losing their job because of that automation. And then we don't talk about what happens to that person. And the truth is what happens to that person is they most likely don't find another job. That job has been wiped off basically this country. So now what do we do? And we haven't really had great answers. We see answers that are, oh, don't worry, I'll bring your job back. And then it never comes back. Right. We just hear these empty platitudes. I'm going to bring the jobs back. It doesn't happen. And part of why it doesn't happen is because these economic forces are just too strong for any politician to try and force back. So what we need to see are big investments like you talked about, like big investments in education. And we need to see big investments towards things that our economy is going towards, whether that's high tech manufacturing or whatever the economy is needing right now, services, what are these growing jobs? We need to see investments and pushes for these jobs. Well, why, which is why it's scary right now listening to the Federal Reserve talking about more austerity and, and cutting, you know, cutting, back, raising interest rates and cutting, uh, you know, cut, slamming on the brakes. But to your point about Wall Street, and I've often said that the greatest con that was ever done on the working class was convincing them uh, that they should give up their divine benefit pensions for these crappy 401ks because eventually we could all be millionaires. You know, I had a guy tell me, you know, 30 years ago, you know, we work here 30 years, you're going to be a millionaire. Not even close. Uh, because Rob stolen, ripped off, thieved, however you want to put it, that happened. But it got us into the mindset of, hey, we got to check the stock prices because, hey, I'm I'm an investor now. I got one share of, of something and it better go up because I need it. It's masterful what they did. This is a huge shift. And I talk about this in my class because I remember my grandfather and my uncle. So my uncle uh, was in Michigan. I'm in Ohio. So some people are offended when I say that. He was in Michigan and uh, worked with the car dealership. They had jobs their entire lives and they had that pension. 
They one job, entire career, and they had a pension. That is not our economy anymore. But we have had these huge shifts in our economy, and we haven't seen huge shifts in policy to match it, right? So we don't all have this one job with a pension anymore, but we didn't have policies to match this. We haven't seen the same investment in Social Security or the same investment in healthcare or education or job training or any of this. We haven't seen the big investments to compensate for and to go along with these huge changes we've seen in the economy. Yeah, it, it's, it's a lot. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're here with Amanda Weinstein. She's an associate professor in the Department of Economics there at Akron University, or University of Akron. I got to get it right because it's, it's that way, not the other. Uh, she's also the co-host of the Suburban Women Problem podcast, which make sure you find on iTunes, Stitcher, all of those places. It is everywhere, just like ours. And if you've missed any of today's program, just joining us, make sure you grab our podcast, The Rick Smith Show anywhere where you get your podcast. Now, uh, Amanda, we're moving into this this moment where uh, Democrats got an election coming up. Inflation is everywhere. We're being told, oh, my God, the sky is falling. It's all bad. It's all Joe Biden's fault. It's the end of humanity as we know it. Oh, my God. And it's all Joe Biden's fault. Um, is, 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 that, is that accurate? No, it's not. Uh, it is really the president does not have that much to do with prices. And if they do, that probably means they're doing something wrong. Right. So the last time we hugely complained, complained about gas prices, this is Nixon. And he decides, OK, if you don't like gas prices, I'll put price controls on. And then what we got was these huge, long lines. And if there's one thing Americans hate more than high prices, it's waiting for anything. Yep. Look at our fast food industry. Uh, so, no, these price, but right. These higher gas prices, these suck, right? These suck for everyday Americans going to the gas pump and seeing these higher prices, going to the grocery store and seeing these higher prices, this sucks. And so part of understanding kind of where the suck comes from is understanding where inflation is coming from. So we still have a pandemic that is affecting supply chains around the world. So what that means is when we go out and buy more things or when we go out and drive more, that means the supply can't handle the increased demand. When supply can't match this increased demand, what that means is we get higher and higher prices, right? So what can we do about it? Uh, so if we see higher prices at something like Starbucks, right? Don't go to Starbucks, right? We have alternatives. We don't have to go to Starbucks, right? Make your own coffee. So if you see higher prices, one way that we can help reduce those prices, uh, switch, don't buy the Starbucks. Uh, but we can't do that with everything. Can't do that with gas and we still need to drive to work. Um, but that's but knowing kind of where those gas prices are coming from, it comes from when we still have a pandemic, not enough people vaccinated, then we're going to have supply chain issues. Yeah. And what that means for everyone is higher prices. Now, two two lessons I've gotten from our our, our this discussion on on inflation over the last couple of weeks. One, like you said, if the prices are too high, you just you don't buy it because, you know, I think a big portion of our inflation problem is good old fashioned American greed and capitalism and opportunism. Hey, we got a pandemic we can blame everything on. Uh, we've got a shortage, uh, an alleged shortage. Let's raise prices so we can fatten the bottom line. And I think that there's some there's some truth in that. When you start looking at the reporting that's coming out of how they're wildly profitable and paying CEOs an awful lot more. And the other lesson I hope we as a country have learned is that we shouldn't have to wait for supply chain uh, things to come from all around the world. Maybe, here's an idea, we should do like past generations of Americans did and make it ourselves. Yeah, so I think we are going to see some more this onshoring of making more of this in this country because we are seeing supply chain issues. You see, you know, things stuck at ports. Um, and so part of our supply chain issues are because we have such a global supply chain right now. So if we make more here in the U.S., we can fix some of those supply chain issues. Um, it also means some of it might come with a higher price tag uh, as we have, you know, better working conditions here, which means better wages for people. But that also could mean higher prices. I'm OK with higher prices as long as we're talking about high quality manufactured goods made by Americans, by my neighbors, maybe even myself. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that the, the, the illusion we were sold is that we could have, you know, really treat the Walmart commercial, you know, a lower prices, better life through lower prices. And what we got were cheap mm -hmm. knockoffs and things that have planned obsolescence uh, to where you're buying things multiple times where it's not cheaper. So, you know, in the long run, buying something, a good quality something and paying for it up front saves you money in the long run. And I'm, I'm all in favor of that. Um, 
but it's something I think we have to we have to think about in this country. And I'm hoping the pandemic has moved us in that direction. And, and look, I love the fact that Joe Biden is talking about bringing back manufacturing. We're seeing a bunch of startups, especially with the electric vehicles. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a great all of is a great point. So I think one thing that's important to think about with these low cost goods at Walmart is if you're in Dallas, Texas, if you're in San Diego, California, this is actually a great deal for you. You get low cost stuff at Walmart. But if you're in the Midwest, if you're in Cleveland, if you're in Flint, if you're in Detroit, this has not been a good deal for you because saying, oh, you get low price goods at Walmart, but you don't have a job is not a good trade off for most Americans. And so what that means is we need to see where the economy is moving, like you mentioned with electric cars, right? If we all want to buy electric cars, then great. Let's make these electric cars here. So we've seen Tesla hugely change this market. And we and oh, my gosh, the Super Bowl is full of those electric car commercials. Right. This is where we're headed. This is great. One thing we need policymakers to do is catch up. We're going to need a whole bunch of EV charging stations that we don't currently have. And that's where it comes back to us, to me, to all of us. So last bit on this before we move on uh, on the inflation front. What's the message for Democrats? I mean, you're the smart person here. What's what's the quick I mean, because we need, you know, the right has death tax, you know, you know, F Joe Biden. Uh, they, they've got their bumper, Jesus, guns and babies. Uh, they've got that. Uh, what's the Jesus, guns and babies on the inflation front? I mean, we have inflation right now because we still have a pandemic that is not exactly fixed. This pandemic is still screwing us over. So if you really don't like high prices, we have to get it in check or just accept the high prices. Yeah, it's the vaccine. It's 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 the, it's the pandemic, stupid. That seems that seems mm -hmm. like a good one. Uh, last question I've got for you. You do a fabulous podcast. Uh, I, I hope po folks will take a look at it. You know, why'd you jump in the middle of this? Why are you throwing this out there? I, I understand you're also doing you're doing it with uh, Lieutenant uh, Vindman's wife. Uh, I'm sorry, I forget her first name. Rachel, I, she's awesome. Yes. Uh, My other co-host, Jasmine, they're so much fun. So give me give me a sense. What, what are you guys what are you guys focusing on? Uh, yeah, so really when we were looking at the political landscape, and this is with uh, an organization called Red, Wine, and Blue that organizes, especially suburban women across the country, we really saw a bit of a void of hearing women's voices, right? So we hear a lot of voices from political pundits across the aisle on both sides and political consultants, but we don't hear a lot of just kind of everyday women, women, the stuff that we talk about every day. We don't hear a lot of everyday women talking about, did you hear what Manchin said the other day? Maybe sometimes, not really. At the bus stop, we're mostly like, hey, do you know what sucks right now? I don't have daycare for the week, right? And I need daycare to get to work, right? These are more the things that I'm talking about. Can I get to work? Do I have daycare or not this week? And so we really, on this podcast, wanted to talk about the things that women were talking about that we don't think enough people are talking about. And I hope folks will take a look at it. It's the Sub Suburban Women Problem Podcast. Uh, we'll make sure we get links out on social media. Amanda, I appreciate you taking some time for us, sharing some some of your expertise. I, I'd love to have you come back and talk to us again real soon. Thank you, Rick. This was a lot of fun. Good stuff. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Amanda Weinstein, uh, I got it right this time. Sometimes I screw that up. Uh, she's an associate professor there at, uh, at University of Akron. Uh, again, the podcast. Make sure you check that out. I'm uh, going to take a quick break right back after this. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. of the show you've heard our labor history in two segments and you can hear them on the radio pretty much anywhere in the u.s labor history has never been more important than it is right now so here's what we'd like you to do tell a teacher tell a teacher that labor history is important and that they can get digestible two-minute lessons that are absolutely free free to download free to use free to share tell a teacher to go to the ricksmithshow.com backslash history and help us put labor back where it belongs in the classroom you know generations of american workers fought bled and died to build the american way of life it's our job to keep their stories alive go tell a teacher that we're here to help them do just that find us at the ricksmithshow.com backslash history today
Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So here's some interesting news. The U.S. Postal Service evidently has finalized their plans to purchase, I guess, 90% of the new vehicles are going to be gasoline, just 10% electric, which I got to tell you, I think is just stupid. I think it is a bad decision, but it's coming from Louis DeJoy, so I'm not surprised. This is another failure, I think, of the Biden administration. They should have fired him months ago and replaced him with somebody who, well, is not Louis DeJoy. Uh, let's go with that. Uh, but the Postal Service is going to spend over $11 billion to purchase what they're saying is uh, 148,000 gasoline-powered del- delivery trucks. And, you know, the thing is, is, you know, what they're saying with the electric vehicles, for all the stopping and the starting and all the idling and all the stuff that, that that'll, you know, gasoline engines do, this would be perfect for the electric vehicle. Uh, the fact that the new contract that DeJoy has entered into only increases the the fuel economy standards 0.4 miles per gallon. I mean, here's, here's the thing. Whether we like it or not, gas prices are going to continue to go up. As more electric vehicles come online, guess what? Less people are going to be buying gas. Gas companies, you know, oil companies, they're going to need their profits. That means prices are going to go up. As you see the, sw- the shift over to uh, more charging stations, you're going to see less frequent gas stations around. Prices are going to go up. Why would you buy vehicles that you're hoping you're going to have for 15 years? Why would you buy those vehicles that some of them will last 20? Now, why would you buy 90% gasoline vehicles? It makes no sense to me, which is why Louis DeJoy did it. And I got to wonder how much is being kicked back. I got to wonder how much is part of that. Uh, just it, That's just, <laughs> I guess it goes without saying. And the thing that gets me is, you know, this big contract that, we talked about this yesterday with a guy running for Senate in Wisconsin, this Oshkosh you know, defense company that, that got this big contract to build these vehicles. They don't have a place yet. They're shopping around in South Carolina. You know why? Because they can be union busters. Because South Carolina is the least unionized state in the country. Also with one of the highest poverty rates, lowest, lowest educational achievement rates. But hey, that's where they're going to go. That's where they're going to they spend the money that we're going to invest in new vehicles for the Postal Service. And why? More profits for them. You know, back to what we were talking about with Amanda. The policy decisions in this country are all about feeding profits to the very wealthy, all about enriching the bottom line of corporate America instead of creating good jobs that support families and and grow our our ability for workers to, to have disposable income instead of just getting by paycheck after paycheck. That's what our policymakers have done. And it's it's not new. This is this has been decades in the making. It's just angering and frustrating when you see it happen time and time again. And then you have someone like Ron Johnson. The senator from Wisconsin said, oh, we don't need those jobs. We don't need those thousand good union jobs with health care and retirement and a living wage and safe working. No, we don't need any of that stuff. We got enough jobs. We got those fast food jobs. We got those Uber and those uh, those you know, those Instacart jobs. We got all those. Great. Already got too many. Welcome to America. The land where Republicans hate the working class. It's that simple. If you're just joining us, make sure you grab the podcast. You can do that at therigsmithshow.com or anywhere where you get your podcasts. Love to hear what you have to say, what you think. Email me, Rick, at therigsmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1875. 
That was the day the National Marine Engineers Association was founded at a meeting in Cleveland, Ohio. The association represented steamboat engineers, most from boats navigating the Great Lakes. Being a steamboat engineer was risky business. Boilers could explode, fires could start on board, vessels could sink. Crews often had little training. And engineers that complained about the unsafe conditions or got caught talking union could lose their place on a ship. One history of the Great Lakes described the role of the engineer writing, down in the bowels of the vessel, he controls not only the propulsion, but the steering, lighting, pumping, anchoring, and ventilation of the modern marine structure. And on the Great Warship, he is even responsible the maneuvering of the heavy guns. In 1854, the engineers in Buffalo banded together in an association of their own. And in the next two decades, other cities followed. But the engineers knew that the only way to have real power to change their working conditions was to form a national organization. Ten delegates from Buffalo, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, and Baltimore attended the founding meeting. One of the union's early causes was to stop American shipping companies from hiring foreign engineers in international waters. In 1884, Congress passed a bill requiring officers on American ships to be U.S. citizens. The union grew to more than 20,000 members by the end of World War I. But the union fell on hard times during the Great Depression, losing more than 75% of its membership. In an effort to shore up U.S. shipping, Congress passed the Merchant Marine Act in 1936, calling for the construction of 500 new ships. Today, the union is part of the AFL-CIO under the name Marine Engineers Beneficial Association. In 1972, I was part of a nationwide campaign that came close to getting the U.S. Senate to reject Earl Butts, Richard Nixon's choice for Secretary of Agriculture. A coalition of grassroots farmers, consumers, and public interest organizations teamed up with progressive senators to undertake the almost impossible challenge of defeating the cabinet nominee. The 51 to 44 Senate vote was so close because we were able to expose Butts as, well, as Bud Ugly. We brought the abusive power of corporate agribusiness into the public consciousness for the first time. We had won a moral victory, but it turned out to be a curse and a blessing. First, the curse. Butts had risen to prominence in the world of agriculture by devoting himself to the corporate takeover of the global food economy. He openly promoted the preeminence of middlemen food manufacturers over family farmers. Agriculture is no longer a way of life, he barked. It's a business. He instructed farmers to get big or get out and proceeded to shove tens of thousands of them out by promoting an export-based, corporate-run food economy. Adapt, he warned, or die. The ruination of farms and rural communities, Butts added, releases people to do something useful in our society. This is Jim Hightower saying the curse of Butts, however, spun off a blessing. Small farmers and food artisans practically threw up at the resulting twinkieization of America's food. They were sickened that nature's own contribution to human culture was being turned into another plasticized product of corporate profiteers. They threw themselves into creating and sustaining a viable alternative, linking locally with consumers, environmentalists, community activists, marketers, and others. The Good Food Rebellion has since sprouted, spread, and blossomed from coast to coast. To find farmers markets and other expressions of this movement right where you live, go to localharvest.org. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So, some good news. Some interesting, something interesting to do for a change. Uh, on Thursday, February 24th, there will be a private screening of the movie 9 to 5. You know, the classic with Lily Tomlin and Dolly Parton and, and all of Jane Fonda and all of those. Remember that? Uh, private, private screening, private virtual screening. And I guess you get to watch it with Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin. There'll be a discussion afterwards. Uh, evidently limited tickets, limited tickets. Uh, and we will get links out on social media on how you can get that. So you got to follow us on Twitter at Rick Smith Show. 
at Rick Smith Show or on Facebook or one of the other places where you grab our stuff in order to get it. We'll get links out. Uh, but here to share some thoughts on, well, the big event, how you can participate, uh, why we're, we're doing this, and, well, what the hope out of the other side is. I've asked Saru Yarman to come talk with us. She is the chief cook and bottle washer there at One Fair Wage. Uh, Saru, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me. So tell me about this this big event. What 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 what's it what's this for? Why are we doing it? Uh, tell me why. Well, it's really exciting. Um, we're in a moment of just historic worker, I think, uprising and revolt. A, a million workers have left the restaurant industry, and millions more say they're leaving. Eighty percent say the only thing that would make them come back to work in restaurants is a full livable wage with tips on top. And um, in that moment of historic worker revolt, we are moving bills and ballot measures in a number of states around the country to raise wages and end subminimum wages for tipped workers, which is still $2.13 at the federal level. And in particular, we've got it moving on the ballot in November in Michigan, where um, the wage is still $3.67, but we do know that putting it on the ballot will motivate hundreds of thousands of working people to go to the ballot this November to vote themselves a raise, which is important because Michigan has a really critical election. The governor and AG are up for re-election, and that has implications for the presidential election in Michigan in 2024. And so we've been working with Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin on these issues for many years. And of course, they've been working on these issues for over 40 years since they made the movie Nine to Five. And so we decided to put on this fun event where they could show us the movie, talk to us about, you know, share stories of how it was made, why they made the movie, and share stories of putting the movie together in the aftermath, and then talk about how these issues that were uplifted in the movie for working women still persist today. Sexual harassment, long hours, low wages still persist today. And so we'll be talking a lot about the movie, Nine to Five, and then talking about uh, how it relates to issues of working women all over the country and in particular in Michigan where we've got this really exciting measure that we're putting on the ballot. And I do wanna say we're seeing Michigan as the kickoff to do this in dozens of states over the next few years. It's a really exciting moment. No, because it's something that's needed. So in this discussion, are we gonna be moving towards activism to kind of like they did in the movie? Because you know, I kind of <laughs> like the idea that they tied Dabney Coleman up and, and all the things that they, <laughs> they did. If, if we could do that, we could probably <laughs> stop harassment in the workplace, I think. Absolutely. Um, Jane was already in advance of the event sharing with me various stories about that image of tying up the boss. Um, but she was also sharing that, in fact, that movie is one of the very few movies in history that actually led to the formation of a union, a union of uh, people who work, women who work in offices that is still a part of SEIU today. And so the hope is that we're in a similar moment where um, these discussions, you know, understanding what's happening for workers is going to lead to some real incredible change. You know, and, and that's an important thing to remember that, that there used to be office workers for all, all different crafts. In fact, just the other day, I came across uh, a waitress union in Detroit uh, that, you know, back, I think it was in the in the 40s where, you know, these waitresses said, you know, nope, nope, we're going on strike and, yeah. and began the formation of a waitress union. And you go, where, why did that stop? Why did that go away? Why don't we, why don't we have that today? Something I've advocated for many years. And I know it's a transient industry and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I, I still go back to this idea that you got to have a voice in the job. You got to have some say and you've got to have some power to make better conditions, wages, hours, all of that stuff for yourselves. And that would be the place where I think it would be be fabulous. But there once was a, a waitress union. Yeah. In fact, there is another movie that's worth watching um, called When Tomorrow Comes uh, with Irene Dunn. So it's like way back, black and white. It's a romance, but it's actually all about waitresses unionizing. <laughs> Um, in the 30s. So, you know, there, you're right. There have been moments when workers have organized more so than today. But I actually think, Rick, we're heading in that direction. We are in a moment where workers are rising up. As I said, millions of workers have left the restaurant industry and they're saying they won't come back until they get living wages. And those who are left behind are organizing in ways we have never seen. They're 
organizing at Starbucks. I even last year we saw the women at Hooters push back on the uniforms in a way that we have never seen in all these years of organizing since Hooters was formed. We've not seen the women push back on the uniforms and they finally did last year. So we're in a moment where workers are telling us at least that they're recognizing their worth. They're, they, they're saying we're worth more than two and three dollars an hour, which continues to be 238 in Pennsylvania, 367 in Michigan. I mean, these numbers are ridiculous. Yeah. And it's taken 150 years since emancipation when the subminimum wage for tip workers was created. It's taken 150 years and a global pandemic for millions of workers to say enough is enough. I refuse to work for these wages. No, it's amazing the, the position that, that we we put workers in across this country. And you're right. We are seeing this kind of this resurgence, which I'm thrilled about because I was yeah. joking the other day that, you know, 100 years ago, we had the coal wars. Right now, we're having the coffee wars. I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems like every coffee shop in the country is going, hey, I'm tired of this garbage. Uh, yeah. We're going to unionize. Yep, yep. They're organizing. They're unionizing. They're demanding higher wages. And what's so exciting is we're seeing employers respond. We are seeing wages going up. We've tracked thousands of restaurants, mostly independent restaurants. The chains are still, you know, the dinosaurs stuck in their ways. But we're seeing thousands of independent restaurants across the country raise wages to 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour. I even saw a restaurant in Cape Cod offering 50 bucks an hour plus tips. So we are seeing wow. employers raise wages. And a lot of those employers are also saying, you know what? We can't do it alone. We need a level playing field. We need everybody's wages to go up. And they're also saying we're raising wages and we still can't get workers to come back because workers aren't dumb and they know this could be temporary. So workers won't come back unless they actually are guaranteed, you know, that it's the law that they get paid a livable wage. And like you said, that they have some voice and power on the job. So it's an amazing historic moment where workers are organizing and employers are responding. You, you hit on the main, the central point there. Uh, that workers are afraid they're going to claw all this stuff back. And as I say, this is the this is the moment to organize and to get that in writing, uh, exactly. to have a written contract and make sure that that they cannot claw that stuff back. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. We're here with Sar Saru Yairaman. She is the president of One Fair Wage. Their website, onefairwage.com. We'll get links out on social media, how you can follow that. Also, Thursday, uh, that would be tomorrow going to be the big uh, nine to five event. You're going to want to make sure you check our social media sites to, to get access to that. Uh, what the heck? What's the, what's the website where people can go to, to sign up for this? Um, you can just go to our website, www.onefairwage.com, and you'll see a link to the event tomorrow, which is really exciting. And we'll make sure we get links out on that. Now, you know, you, you, we also hit on something that, that's been one of those things that I've been talking about for years the messaging that comes out in, in films and in popular culture. You know, when I when I was a little kid, the union message was there, union job, better life. You saw it, you know, people, they got, their lives got better. They aspired to have union jobs. And then, you know, 80s, we started seeing, well, the union thugs, you know, the Teamsters with the baseball bats, that kind of stuff. Now we, we, we see nothing. Do you, do you foresee a moment where we start telling those stories of, of union job, better life again? I do, Rick, but I think I think it's evolving in a way that, look, I think workers right now, particularly younger workers, are organizing in a thousand different ways. I, it's sort of like the beginnings of the labor movement where people didn't necessarily use the word union, but they were organizing. And in many cases, they were doing things that unions do. They were striking. They were demanding things from the boss. They were getting together. And, and I think people should know whether you have a union or not, you actually have the right to win, to make demands of your employer as a collective. You could call it a union, you could call it a worker organization, you can call it just us in the workplace. If more than one person gets together, meaning two or more people go to the boss and say, we demand X, Y, and Z, you cannot be retaliated against. You have rights regardless of whether it's called a union or something else. And I just think in this moment, when things are kind of exploding and a lot of young people are getting engaged, we shouldn't tie them to any one way of doing things. We should let a thousand flowers bloom. We should let people organize however they want to organize in the workplace, and we should support them. No, I do. Absolutely. I support organizing and all that in the workplace. Problem is yeah. uh, our current legal structure 
Exactly. Uh, in order well, that's why if you, I think there are a lot of ways. We found ways around that. We've organized workers in restaurants to make demands of their bosses without calling it a union, and they haven't had to follow like 8B3 picketing line laws and all of those kinds of things. So I think there is a way to let people organize and perhaps through that effort change labor law in this country so that it can get easier. No, we desperately need it. Now, you said a moment ago that you're planning on expanding uh, into, into multiple states. And it's, yeah. again, this kind of grassroots organizing is something we desperately need. And I know you've been doing this for a long time. I think the first time I interviewed you, you was probably, I don't know, like like 10 years ago almost. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, you know, this is this has been your, your career's work uh, this expansion, where where are you seeing this happen? Is it is it coming to Pennsylvania? Where where do you see this going? Oh, absolutely. We you know we've been working on Pennsylvania for a while now, and if we can get the legislature to flip, which I believe we can, I think Pennsylvania could have one of the best minimum wage laws in the country. You know, we've been working on ending not only raising the wage to fifteen, but ending the subminimum wage for tipped workers and workers with disabilities and youth and incarcerated workers in Pennsylvania. I think Pennsylvania could be a real example, but we are we are looking at 25 states where we can raise wages and end subminimum wages by the United States 250th anniversary, which is 2026. And we've decided to do this. We just made this announcement last Monday, but we've decided to do this really following the lead of millions of workers who are rising up right now and saying this is not a normal moment. This is not business as usual. We refuse to accept business as usual. And so if they're not accepting business as usual, we as the organizers and the advocates and the cheerleaders and supporters, we also have to think this is not business as usual. And so instead of the four or five states where we had been moving campaigns, we said, no, it's time to do this in 25 states. It's time to make sure that if Congress is not gonna act, we do this in at least half the states impacting more than half of all workers, low wage workers in this country. So we decided kind of in honor and in support of workers who are rising up all over from Louisiana, they're, they're, they're walking away from $2 jobs to all over the country in honor of that, we're expanding our work and we are committed to get this done 50, at least $15 an hour for at least half the country or more in the next four years. Now, now, Saru, I've had a conversation with with numerous waitresses over the years, and you know, again recently, where I had one say, "No, no, we, we can't we can't raise the minimum wage, or you know, we're gonna have all these horrible things are gonna happen. You know, places are gonna are gonna lay people off. They'll go to automation. You'll have self service stuff. You, I'm sure you have heard all of them, and then some. Yeah. Uh, I'll lay some of the fears out there that you know it's not Armageddon to ask for a decent wage. It's not yeah. the end of humanity if you want to have some dignity and respect in your paycheck. Please, uh, I'll lay some of yeah. those fears. Well, listen, there have always been seven states that required all restaurants and all employers in those states to pay a full minimum wage with tips on top. That's California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska. So not all blue states, not all high wealth or urban states, a real mix of states. In these seven states, we find paying people a full livable wage with tips on top has resulted in actually the restaurant industry growing faster than Pennsylvania and the 43 states with the subminimum wage for tipped workers. We have found in those states, job growth is higher. We have found tipping averages are higher. We have found small business restaurants grow faster. Even Denny's was caught red-handed last year by Newsweek. David Sirota, you know, it's great journalist, wrote in Newsweek, they caught them when they were telling Congress, the National Restaurant Association, we can't pay 15 and a full minimum wage for tipped workers, we'll go out of business. In that same moment, the CFO of Denny's was telling shareholders, actually paying 15 and one fair wage has resulted in Denny's growing faster in California than any state in the US because consumer spending is higher in California. That's why tipping is higher. That's why the restaurant industry is growing faster. It's because consumer spending has been higher and frankly, more stable in those states than the 43 states during the pandemic. Those states lost fewer restaurants during the pandemic than Pennsylvania and the rest of the country. So that we already know it can work. You don't have to go out of the country. You can see states in the US that are already doing it. And even you can see neighboring states. Look, if you're in Pennsylvania, New York state has a $15 minimum wage and it's $10 for servers. We still don't think that's enough. It should be 15, but if it's $10 in New York and $2.83 in Pennsylvania, 
And frankly, we've looked at border counties between New York and Pennsylvania, and all the restaurants on the New York side are doing better. With a $10 wage compared to 283 in Pennsylvania, what does that say to you? It means that, again, when people are paid more, what do they do? They go, they spend it, they eat out, they take their families to eat out. We all are worried about inflation. Well, what, what's going to happen when there's inflation and then there's millions of workers whose wages have not gone up? Where's the consumption going to happen? It's it's not. And so point, people but... need the ability to consume. People need the ability to spend. And they need, frankly, the ability to survive. And that's why they're leaving the industry. So raising wages does create stability, does increase consumption, does help the GDP. And it allows workers to stay in an industry that they, frankly, love. But here's the, the thing. I was told that, that the states with the lower wages would have more job growth. People would come here. So all of the businesses, those restaurants in New York would come here to Pennsylvania to, to pay the happened. cheaper wage. Because <laughs> yeah. Pennsylvania has the lowest minimum wage of any of its border states. We're even pulling West Virginia down. How oh bad is gosh. that? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> but it's not true. I'm sorry. Pennsylvania's restaurant industry is not growing as fast as its neighbor states. Even restaurants across the border from Pennsylvania are doing better than restaurants in Pennsylvania. And again, it's because when you're paid $2.83, you do not have the ability to take your family out to eat. And so consumption is lower. Yeah. Well, we've got a governor currently that would sign a minimum wage bill immediately. Tom Wolf is a good guy. I like him as governor. I fear what happens this November. Uh, but, you know, at the end of it, if we can get the Republicans out of the General Assembly, get some folks in there, some pro-worker people in those places, we can do just that. I hope folks will check out the website, onefairwage.com. Sign up for the big virtual screening of 9 to 5 on February 24th. That is a Thursday. So you have an opportunity to uh, interact with with Lily Tomlin and and Jane Fonda. It'll be a great event. Highly suggested. Saru, thanks so much for the time. Appreciate the insight. Thank you so much. Fabulous stuff. Uh, again, make sure you check out onefairwage.com so you can take a look at the work that they're doing. Also sign up for the big, well, for the big shindig. Uh, if you've missed any of the program, make sure you download the podcast at thericksmithshow.com. Take the program on the go. Quick break. Right back. Stick around. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show. Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1969. That was the day black food workers went on strike at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Their strike intersected many points central to the social upheaval of the period, including the rights of public sector workers. Besides extremely low wages, workers complained of racial abuse and discrimination on the job. When the administration ignored their demands, the cafeteria workers sat down at the tables and refused to return to the kitchens. Black women workers like Mary Smith and Elizabeth Brooks organized protests and rallies to build public support on and off of campus. As the strike wore on, many students rallied to their defense. The black student movement was the first campus group to support the cafeteria workers. Noting the lag of desegregation on southern campuses and in the South generally, black students added their own demands to those of the workers. They included the expansion of black student aid programs and black study programs. Clashes escalated between students at Lenore Hall a few weeks later when opposing white students attacked integrated groups of students sympathetic to the strike, forcing the closure of the cafeteria hall. Governor Robert Scott ordered the National Guard on standby. Finally, the workers formed a union and won many of their demands. This benefited 5,000 other state employees as well. But a month later, the University of North Carolina administration betrayed them by contracting out the food service. Many were laid off or fired for union activities. By the end of the year, the now AFSCME organized workforce struck again over many of the same issues. When renewed student strike support was threatened, management quickly caved and the strike ended in victory. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com.
Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out the website, therigsmithshow.com. If you miss any of the program, anything, get the podcast. Never miss a second. Always be up to date, therigsmithshow.com. Wherever you get your podcasts from iHeart to uh, iTunes to uh, Stitcher to Podbean, uh, everywhere, Google, all, all over, you name it, we are there. Uh, bringing up the fact that and, and um, that, that popped into my head talking to Saru about the waitress union, uh, the waiters and waitress union, uh, 1937. In fact, in a couple of days was the, the anniversary, which is why it, it was pop. It was in my head. Um, February 27th, 1937. Uh, the organizer for the waiters and waitress union at 11 a.m., in the Woolworths Five and Dime, yelled, strike girls, strike! And every one of them immediately put down what they were doing, stopped, and and stopped working, and left. Out to the picket line. The customers sat there with empty cups going, hey, what about us? The management was going, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everything stopped. And look, you know, this was a, a major moment in the American labor movement. This is early on. Uh, this is a very short period of time after the National Labor Relations Act is passed in 1935. Uh, this is, you know, in, in the cold of winter where you had these young women. And I think the numbers were like something like 85 percent of the people who were doing these jobs were women under the age of 26. And and think about the, you know, because we often hear about, you know, the, this power, this power dynamic. You had these young women who I'm sure needed the jobs just like anybody else, who were going up against, you know, the behemoth of the era. You know, the you know, Woolworths, you know, the, the Woolworths five and dime. You know, we everyone, everyone my age knows what a Woolworths was. They're all gone now because they got wiped out by Kmart and then Walmart and, and soon Amazon's gonna take everything else over uh, as well. But they were the they were the powerhouse. Uh, the lunch counter at Woolworths, anyone my age and older. You you've spent some time at the at the Woolworths counter, uh, and and those people were fabulous. Some of the best memories I have of my grandmother were going to that to that lunch counter. And on on that day, February twenty seventh, you had all these these people who struck, and they they got better wages, better working conditions. You know that that kind of stuff happened. Lives got better, which is why I'm thrilled to see that in Virginia. You got about 1,300 workers at Hershey's uh, in Stewart's Draft, Virginia. They are uh, they're about to organize the uh, uh, the Reese's workers, and this is this is kind of important. This is kind of a big deal. Uh, you've got you know Hershey Hershey you know, kind of ran away to go south a little bit, and they, in Mexico they went. Uh, I hope this kind of organizing, and we're going to reach out to our friends at the BCTGM and and find out what it is they're doing, and we can get some people to come talk about this because uh, this is this is good stuff. Hopefully, hopefully, this will will have a ripple effect to the other Hershey workers, uh, the Reese's workers here in the in the Harrisburg area out there in Hershey, to maybe they will begin to organize. Because you know what, I've heard a lot of rumblings, people don't happy about you know. Working, you know, multiple, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks without a day off, uh, long, long hours, and not getting the wage that they deserve, that they earn. This is a company wildly profitable, and these companies don't like to share, don't like to share. Uh, so for me, this is this is a good thing, and and good on them, because uh, look, I've always said I, I believe every worker. Every worker should join a union. Every worker should have that power, should have that ability to have a say in where they spend, you know, a good portion of their lives. Every person should have that ability to demand better wages, hours, conditions, and sit down with the boss and bargain collectively. And I look at this idiot that's driving to Washington, D.C. I talked about earlier. Uh, the, the workers I talked to that worked for the company he, 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 was, he was the birth lottery of, they aren't happy. They know they're getting screwed. They sure organized. Just my view. Uh, anyway, if you missed any of today's program, download the podcast at the website. Take the program on the go. You got something on your mind? Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. 
Email Rick. At Rick at the Rick Smith Show.com. Until next time, this has been the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.